Well, I'm up here without a, a watch or a clock, so look out. We may get done early or late, depending on, it's all, it's all up to you. Because if you start to get bored, then I'll quit. If, you, if you're attentive and listen, then, uh, uh-oh, we, there, there's help on the way here. Thank you. Now the question is, I think that sent a message. So I'm not sure the clock even works on that thing. At the beginning of the sermon here, I'd like you to take out a pencil and paper. I'm going to have you write down three lines. I'm just letting you take out pen and paper. So you're ready. The premise that we're going to look at this afternoon during the sermon is this. The change that came versus the change to come. So in my notes here, I have change highlighted in all capital letters. The change that came versus the change to come. Subtitling that we have, and this is what we're going to look at, the difference and the similarities between these two constructs or, if you will, events. Now, lest you think that I just made that up, let me uh, quote to you quickly the basic scriptures that put together that construct. The first one is over in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word came to be flesh and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is the change that came. And then we go over to, I'll, I'll, I'll quote two scriptures regarding the change, uh, the change to come. The first one is found in Job chapter 14. All the days of my heart service, I will wait till my change comes. You shall call and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. So that was Job in the midst of a fiery trial. He looked forward and he called out to God and said that he would wait for the change to come. Paul says something very similar in his uh, letter to the Corinthians, and we'll look at that a little bit later. He, ri he wrote, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed at this change yet to come. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So that forms the basis of the, the topic we will look at this afternoon, the change that came versus the change to come. Let's take a closer look at the change that came. Come with me over to the book of John. John chapter 1, and we'll read a couple of verses here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Here we see in the opening passage of the book of John the fact that Jesus Christ, as the pre-existent Word, ever existed. Continuing, in him was life, and the life was in the light of men, and the light shines into the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and the man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. Now if we uh, jump ahead to verse 14, this is the pivotal scripture, the thesis statement, if you will, of the book of John. So everything that is in the book of John after this in some way 
clarifies, expounds on, or supports this statement. In verse 14, John writes, And the Word became flesh, or we might say the Word came to be flesh. Now this is a change that was pivotal because it flew into the face of everything that philosophers prior to and contemporary of Jesus Christ taught and believed. The idea that the ever-existing God would at one point come to be flesh and dwell among men was considered to be absurd. This actual event is pivotal because it makes possible the change that is yet to come. I'd like to quote from some material I wrote a while back, and some of it is going to be published next month, with regard to this particular passage. Referring back to John chapter 1, verse 14, and I quote, Understanding what God said through John is not difficult. I mean, there's nothing difficult grammatically about the construct and the word came to be flesh. And it's a pretty symbol. What the word once was changed to become a flesh and blood human being. Understanding what God said is not difficult. Be believing the audacity of the claim was the challenge then as it is now. God becoming flesh as the only begotten of the Father flies in the face of orthodoxy. To the Jews it was blasphemous, a blasphemous stumbling, stumbling block because it was not consistent with their incomplete view of monotheism. To the Greeks it was foolishness because their philosophers had denied the possibility of a God becoming human, becoming human flesh for centuries. Now, one of the reasons that I want us to ponder this, uh, this afternoon is that what is usually what is popular belief is in direct opposition of what actually is. And if you don't uh, notice that in the um, world in which we live here, you're not paying much attention. Because so much, much of what is accepted by majority is often later proven to be fallacious. And that was the case with Jesus Christ coming. Satan had inspired philosophers in the preceding centuries to raise philosophical constructs, and I will read a few of them here in a minute, so that when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came, all the all of the intellectual constructs that were there would be in direct opposition of what actually happened. And this is why uh, God so often, it is so often that God then brings to nothing what man said couldn't be done. Notice this, Philo, Philo was a Jewish philosopher that was contemporary with um, Jesus Christ. I think he well, he outlived Jesus Christ by a few years, but in any case, he was in that particular um, time period. Philo argues that the divine logos never mixes with things which are created, thus destined to perish, but attends to the one alone. That's a quote. So when John wrote that the word, the logos became flesh, he was writing against the intellectual giants of his day. Because they said, what Jesus Christ claimed to be was impossible because the Logos would never mix with things which are created. Continuing, which is in direct contradiction to John's claim that the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, mixing, quote, with the things which are created. In Philo's view, the Logos is an ambassador and suppliant, neither unbegotten nor begotten, 
as are sensible things. And notice what, what, um, what John wrote. He wrote that we held, beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John wrote that the Logos was the only begotten of the Father. Philo, by contrast, was saying that that's impossible. I mean, no God would uh, involve himself with man. The word becoming flesh wiped away centuries of wisdom and brought to nothing philosophical constructs that limited God's interaction with his own creation by making the physical creation evil and the spiritual realm mystical and unknowable. What does this by definition do for the claim? It does what it says it does. John could not have been any clearer. The word logos, who once was with God and was God, had come to be flesh. Very God became very flesh. It does not mean that he was no longer God. It means he was no longer spirit because he had become flesh. That's change. That demonstrates the, the um, tremendous love that God had for humanity. And uh, perhaps now it's appropriate to um, jump over to John chapter 3, verse 16. Notice these very famous words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved the world so much that he enabled a change that was considered by everybody else to be an impossibility. That God would come to be man as the only begotten of the Father as we read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So here contained in this, as I said, a, a central scripture to Christianity, we see that it was God's will. More importantly, it was not just something that was a theoretical construct. In order to demonstrate his love for the world, God came to be flesh. In order to provide, as we will see a little bit later, a pathway forward to the change that is yet to come. And it is implied here in this particular passage because absent God's love for man, which was demonstra demonstrated through the coming of his son, Mankind, mortal as it was created, never would have had an opportunity for life everlasting, which is an attribute of who God is. So we see that the change that came enabled the change that is yet to come. The two, or I should say the second one, is very much connected was the first. And I think it is important, I mean, I keep, maybe I sound like a broken record, I, but I believe it is very important that we recognize that this flew in face of popular thinking at the time. And uh, as we go forward, we will find that we are increasingly in opposition to popular thinking of our day. We live in, as we discussed some weeks back, a post-truth culture in which people expect their feelings and perception, if expressed, they expect reality to line up with it. I mean, perhaps the uh, most reasoned and most arrogant um, a demonstration of that was in recent months in which our duly elected President of the United States health and mental capacity was brought into question uh, by the uh, experts of this world 
And, and then following an examination, I don't know how many of you saw that report, I mean, it was an unprecedented um, disclosure of a president's health. And it, it was a sad day for um, the news media, in fact, because everything that they had said was proven by a very unbiased doctor who has been the presidential doctor for um, multiple presidents from multiple parties. It was just patently false. And I think that's an example. Not everything that is banded around in the news media is false, but um, it definitely highlighted the fact that we need to um, be awake and prove all things. Because just because somebody on television says something and appears to be an expert means nothing. It really means nothing. And it's no different in the uh, religious world. So now let's um, take a look at the change to come. Turn with me now to Job chapter 14. And we'll look at this in context. <clears throat> Job chapter <coughs> 13, uh, chapter 14, verse 13. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. So here, um, this is under the general category of Job's despondent prayer. Verse 14, if a man dies, he asks, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. So here you had an Old Testament individual who understood that after death, there would be a resurrection to a different type of life, which he characterized as a change. You shall call and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. For now you number my steps, but do not watch over my sin. This was the change that would yet come. Now, I would just like to um, draw to our attention here. Uh, what is popular thinking today with regard to the afterlife? I mean, you have a whole spectrum of ideas uh, from uh, reincarnation to pantheism to all the other isms. Um, as someone said, it should be wasms. <laughs> I forget who quote. I, I heard that quote recently, and I forget who uh, it was that said it, so I can't give appropriate attribution, but you, know, you have all these isms uh, that, for the most part, um, are wrong. And as was mentioned in the sermonette, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, they just don't want to go tonight, accord according to the country song. What's the truth? The truth is that the change that came enabled a change yet to come that is tied directly to the resurrection. And a resurrection, um, whether the resurrection of Jesus Christ or the resurrection um, at Jesus' first coming or the resurrection after the millennium or the third resurrection, is central to the reason we're here. And we'll go to those scriptures a little bit later because, again, um, either the Logos in contrary to what was the philosophical thinking of the day, came to be flesh in order that God's love might be expressed, died on the cross, was resurrected to life to provide a pathway for us to follow. And what I hope to do here in the um, 
time that we share is to show that you know when when the maybe trite expression following Jesus Christ, what it really means. What it really means is that we follow Jesus Christ in every respect. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And you might put a marker here because we'll, we'll come back to it. And here's what I read in part earlier. Verse 15, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, that's a declarative statement. We in our flesh, we as we exist today, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It, it requires something, actually to allude to something that I'll uh, talk about a little bit later, it requires something that human beings in general resist. Change. Why do you think that is so? It's change that makes possible what God wants us to be. It is change that Satan obstructs and resists because it prevents, he in doing so hopes to prevent what God wants us to be. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So whether we are alive or dead, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ does not matter. Either way, we will be changed. In either case, we will experience the change yet to come. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for the corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So that when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. It is the change yet to come that ultimately will deliver man from its mortal ex mortal, or should I say, from its morbid existence that we experience today. But it's only possible because of the change that already occurred. God, the Word, came to be man. I mean, that was the ultimate act of humility, the demotion of demotions, if you will. And again, as I mentioned, it flies in the face of popular belief. Popular belief, you can almost take it to the bank that it is inaccurate at best or just patently false. <coughs> so that's the change yet to come. So what's the difference? Jesus Christ came to be man and then died and was resurrected and was glorified as he prayed on the night of his uh, crucifixion was the glory that he had before the world began. So he came from glory to be man, to be glorified again was the glory that he had before the world began. So we follow in that path. I mean, we might 
um, look at it this way. We, we have Jesus Christ coming from infinity, going into infinity. And we join him on that path. But there's a distinct difference. And the distinct difference is that while the destination, and we will look at this, is the same or similar, the, we come from a very different origin. We read in John chapter 1, we'll go back there for a minute, and again, there have been volumes written about this particular verse. But what it says, again, I would argue it's not complex grammar. It's not difficult to understand. It might be difficult to believe. It simply states that in the beginning, at, the be at that moment in time when time began, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. At that moment in time when time began, the one who became Jesus Christ, the one who came to be flesh, already existed. Ever existing. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 10, there are many scriptures. I'll just um, read a few. Revelation chapter 10. <clears throat> Verse 5, And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the earth that are in, the, in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. So the angel swears by the one whoever existed. That is a unique characteristic that only God claims or can claim. And again, I, I, I wanted to point out the difference, so let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What we see here is that the distinct and defining difference between the change that came and the change that is yet to come is that while God ever existed, because he's God, man was, first of all, created into existence. And subsequently, all of mankind has been born into existence. So while, as we will see, that there are similarities, and, and when we begin to follow Jesus Christ, a, a path is established that goes on into infinity. But the defining difference is that it is a path that begins at some point in time. And that is a, um, shall we say, a huge existence. It's an existential issue that will always be a defining difference between our glorification and that of Christ's. But that said, that should in no way take away from the meaning, the glory, the weight, of the change that is yet to come. So let's take, so if you'll bear with me here, um, I want to go into some detail 
on what I have termed as the similarities. Again, if you noted at the beginning, the construct, the topic is the change that came versus the change, the change to come, the difference, and the similarities. The difference singular, the similarities plural. So let's take a look at this, and I, the, I, I, want, I want to um, put the similarities in the context of um, a very familiar, if you will, um, but very often not followed Christian idea, following Jesus Christ. How many times have you heard that, and in how many different ways? I mean, it's been used and bantered about so much that it almost becomes meaningless and petty. But it's not. John chapter 12. <clears throat> John chapter 12, verse 23, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So here we, we connect with the change that has already occurred. See, Jesus, or I should say the word, first changed to become man and then change to be glorified, as he <clears throat> uh, mentions here. Verse 24, Most assuredly I say to you, and I find this interesting, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So, this is, so here he's talking about his glorification on the one hand, and his death on the other, and by implication, as we will read uh, in a few minutes, um, he is mapping out our path. You have to die to live, if you will. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal, eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. If anyone, I mean, if, if you want to be part of this, if you, if you want to participate in the change to come, follow me. Now, if you would go through the New Testament, you would find follow me uh, used repeatedly. Some took it seriously, dropped their nets, and followed him immediately. Others had other things more important to do. But the path forward to change in every respect, whether now in our life or the change that is yet to come, involves following Jesus Christ. And the interesting thing is that he made a pathway clear in his way of life, in his speech, in how he confronted the establishment at that time, and how he was willing to die a horrid death in order to be able to be resurrected and glorified again with the glory that he had before the world was. You see, aside from the defining difference that I mentioned, the pathway is the same. The pathway leads into infinity, everlasting life. I mean, that's what John 3.16 says. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we might have everlasting life. It lasts forever. The difference is that it has a beginning, which he does not. That's the defining difference. So, Verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So as we look at the, the pathway to the change that is yet to come, let's keep in mind the concept of following Jesus Christ. Notice, <coughs> 
in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came to Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. You see, after right at the beginning of Jesus Christ's ministry, before he went out and called any of the disciples and commanded them to follow him, he started down the pathway that all who would follow him would also have to go through. <coughs> Notice, I mean, it was theologically um, unnecessary for Jesus Christ to be baptized. He did that so that his followers could follow him every step to the change to come. I mean, there are those today who ignore baptism, who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. I mean, that, 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 that's an interesting debate. You know, you know, you, uh, explain that to me, okay? So, so you have no need to be baptized, right? Yep. You know, we just accept the Lord Jesus Christ and believe and you will be saved. Okay. If you accept the Lord Jesus Christ and believe and then follow him, that would involve baptism, would it not? You see, following Jesus Christ provides a model and a pathway that we can follow. He was a trailblazer. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? I mean, it, this has always been to me a, a, an interesting passage of Scripture written by none other than the so-called apostle of grace. I mean, grace is a wonderful thing. We all have need of it. But it does not provide license to sin. Verse, verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, the, the interesting thing is that when we follow Jesus Christ down the pathway to the change that is yet to come, it involves change along the way. In fact, we can just kind of write change in all capital letters, all along the pathway, because that's what it is about. Nothing is as permanent as change. <clears throat> For as we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certain, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Follow him to the change that is yet to come. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Go over a page to... 
Romans chapter 8, and we get into a little bit more detail with respect to the change that is yet to come and what it all means. John, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So, the philosophers of Jesus Christ's day, the contemporary thinking and all the, the, all the philosophical constructs said that man, uh, sorry, God would never, would never take it upon himself to lower himself, to empty himself of his glory to become mortal man. I mean, that was just an unthinkable idea among the Greeks and blasphemous, of course, among the Jews. But here it says that the spirit of God bears witness with our spirit, connects with our spirit, to demonstrate that we are, present tense, children of God. So, the change yet to come is preceded that it, with a change that is already in process. And again, the idea, even among theologians of this day, that we are to become, or are, literal children of God is considered borderline blasphemous. And yet when when you, when you read the Bible from the beginning to the end, and I, I'll demonstrate this to you before we finish, that is, that is what it's all about. Notice. And if we are children, then, if then, then we are heirs. And in order to make it clear so that we don't get some fanciful idea or on the other hand, water it down so that it is meaningless, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, makes it real clear. He says, heirs, and then he defines heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So, when, as we will later ask the question, and, and I won't go to the question now, I, I ask you to put into your mind what is, what is this saying. Perhaps this will help. I mean, if, if somehow you or I would become adopted into the British royal family, I mean, all of a sudden, you become a co-heir as the new princess apparently is going to become. Paul said that we would become co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, there is really no under, other way to understand it than for what it actually says. This, again, is a process along the path of following Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> Here Paul is arguing and ad advocating for the resurrection. He's both advocating and um, advocating the... Um, the legitimacy of Christ's resurrection, and then in the same chapter talks about the similarity between Christ's resurrection and ours. Verse 3 of chapter 15, For I delivered to you first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. 
After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. I mean, um, some of the arguments, um, and I, <coughs> I did a bunch of research on this leading up to the feast this last year, and the historicity of Christ's death and resurrection is doubted by very few. Um, what is doubted is whether the sightings of Jesus Christ were hallucinations. I mean, they, uh, let me maybe restate what I just said. The death and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the historicity is doubted by few. The resurrection from the dead and the empty tomb, of course, is um, rejected by many. But look at the contemporary record here. 500 brethren saw the resurrected Jesus Christ at the same time. Now, it is true people have hallucinations, but there is, from my research, not one demonstrated case of group hallucination in which all of them saw the same thing at the same time. So in order for this testimony to not be true, you would have had to have the unprecedented event of 500 people hallucinating at the same time and seeing the very same hallucination. I mean, that's just foolishness. And yet it is the accepted narrative of today. And that's why I say, okay, you know, when, when you have a conversation and somebody talks about the, the pettiness, as <clears throat> Richard, Hawkins would, um, Richard Dawkins would say, of Christ's resurrection, call it out, you know. Are you suggesting? I mean, show me the evidence. Show me one example of a group of five people hallucinating at the same time. And, 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 and I say this because it's an important argument, as, as Paul says here later, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ did not occur, we are all wasting our time. So this is a, an important question. If Jesus Christ was not who he said he was, meaning the Logos becoming flesh, if that change that has already come did not occur, we are all wasting our time. Because it can only be the death of God himself that could possibly pay for the sins of billions of people. And that's an important uh, point as well, because there's confusion on that point. Jesus Christ says in Revelation that he was dead. He I, I was dead. So if you ever have somebody argue on whether or not Jesus, God in the flesh, died on the cross, and no, there wasn't another one in heaven at the same time, um, you know, the second, <coughs> the um, second person of the Godhead, Godhead did not simultaneously exist in heaven and on earth at the same time. Um, I mean, those, those things are um, very important issues because it is a question, an issue, rather, that determines whether or not what we believe is true. Notice, I mean, that's not my, <clears throat> my idea, verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Yes, and we have, and we are found false witnesses of God. As in, in, in Acts chapter 1, the apostles were tasked with being witnesses to his resurrection. To testify that the event, this, this central event to um, Christianity, the resurrection, actually occurred. 
I mean, what was not meant or intended to mean was that they go around knocking on doors and witnessing in that sense. A witness testifies to an event that he was, that he witnessed and saw occur. At 500 of them, continuing. For if the dead, verse 16, do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. <clears throat> I mean, he, he lays it on the line. <clears throat> Now we drop down to verse 35, and, and let's just walk through here. You know, as we follow Jesus Christ on his path, it's the same path. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Foolish one, unless you sow, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies hearkening back to Christ's word in John chapter 12. And what you sow, you do not sow that the body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or another grain, but God gives us a body. God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, and there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of the beasts, another of fish, and another of birds. I mean, Paul didn't know about DNA back then. But he understood what DNA now demonstrates. There's a difference between man and beast. I mean, there are different species, even among the beasts. <clears throat> there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial one, <clears throat> the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star difference from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. So the body that we have today, prior to the change that is yet to come, is very different from the resurrected one. And that, that's, an, that's an interesting discussion in itself um, on how Jesus Christ was actually resurrected. Was he resurrected to glory, as he requested in his uh, prayer the night before? Or, or uh, was he re resurrected to a physical body? I mean, that's a, that's a whole discussion in itself. He was resurrected to glory and manifested himself in a body. So don't get yourself confused in that issue. And um, <laughs> one of the latest things that's circulating is that he was resurrected and sat in his tomb for three hours um, conversing with his father uh, before he exited the, uh, the, um, the stone. So if you hear that one, read your Bible. Um, before you go believing that. You know, the, the other suggestion that is made is that <clears throat> not only did he sit for three hours, and the idea was that he had to be dead for exactly 72 hours, but the Bible only says that he, he was dead and buried for 72 hours. So the, um, the idea that I um, heard recently was that he came back to life and conversed with his father for three hours in the tomb before he then exited without the stone being pushed away, because, I mean, Jesus could go through the stone. And I thought, I don't think I've ever heard anything quite so remarkable. You know, you have an earthquake and an angel coming down that scared the wasu out of the soldiers and rolled the stone away to announce the resurrection to glory. The notion that <laughs> it all occurred uh, previously is complete and utter nonsense. And, and it's important to not go down those paths because it takes away from the truth of what occurred.
Continuing in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in incorruption and is, and it is raised in, the body is sown in corruption, excuse me. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Was Jesus Christ buried in dishonor? I mean, there is, uh, the, the death by uh, crucifixion was considered the, wor the worst of death. So he was sown in dishonor and raised <coughs> in glory. It is sown in weakness and raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. This is the natural. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Did you get that? There is a spiritual body. So says the Bible. And that goes against contemporary philosophical and theological ideas. When you read and when you hear and when somebody tells you there is no spiritual body, read the Bible. There is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a, a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. You see, when Jesus Christ said that we should follow him so that we could be where he is, this is what he's talking about. We came into existence because Adam was created into existence. And up until this time, we have borne his image as mortal men. But it says here that the last Adam, Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. I mean, we're just like Adam. DNA now suggests that everybody goes back to one person. What a surprise. It's remarkable, isn't it? <clears throat> we're the descendants of one man. Not a dozen apes. <clears throat> the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are the heavenly. Now we get to the crux of the matter. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, nobody disputes that. But just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, the image of Adam, we shall bear also the image of the heavenly man. The change that has yet to come. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Well, actually, before we do that, let's go to Acts chapter 1. Because, again, I want, I want us to think about all of this in the context of Christ's command to follow me. Because it's not some trite expression. <clears throat> Verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon me, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of earth. And what, as witnesses for Jesus Christ, what did they do? They testified to these events because they were eyewitnesses to it. 
Verse 9, Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, he went up, as he went up, and behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, and he said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up in heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In like manner. First Thessalonians. Chapter 4, in verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, referring back and consistent with what we read in Acts, Descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead of Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, who will be changed, according to Paul, will, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Following Jesus Christ involves a change to glory at the resurrection as he was glorified and an ascension into the atmosphere of the heavens to meet him as he did. So when Jesus Christ said, follow me, it was not just an empty phrase, it was a very literal command in which we follow him in every Respect. <clears throat> First John chapter 3. Verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. I mean, the concept of children of God... <clears throat> is not widely believed and by some considered blasphemous. But notice what it says in verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So as we conclude... Let's consider a, a couple questions <clears throat> and a benefit of change. One of the things that we raised at the beginning was the fact that God becoming man was considered unthinkable from two perspectives. One was that he would not because... Why would God want to give up his glory and become man? You see, when, when you start considering that, what is going on is carnal thinking. So the issue was whether God would or could. Both of them were considered to be impossible. First of all, God would not. And second of all, God could not because God does not mix with mortal man, and yet the pivotal scripture in John chapter 1 says quite the opposite. And when you, when, you, when you read the book of John in the context of contemporary ideas, it just smashed through centuries of philosophical thinking. And he set the record straight. So I pose a couple questions to you this afternoon in that context before we conclude. Can God, or can a God, can God who came to be man 
I mean, if he's able to do that, can God who came to be man cause man to come to be God? I mean, that's a legitimate question. Isn't that what we just read? And we'll take a look at that um, in a minute. How can you be a son of God without being in the family of God? I mean, follow that logic. Now, there's a difference. God the Father in Jesus Christ ever existed. They're not created. Man was first created into existence and then born into existence. But then... But that's where the similarity begins. And that's where the, the pathway begins that we are to follow that goes out into infinity, and it's called everlasting life. Second question, can a God who ever existed cause man to come into existence to ever exist? I mean, if, if there is a God that was able to ever exist and created the entire universe that we uh, understand better than we ever have, who then created a man in his own image. I mean, is it, is it a stretch to think that this same God is able to cause the man he created into existence, that he would be able to cause this man to then ever exist like he does or will? You see, the word came to be flesh, to create a pathway that we could follow so that no one would perish but have everlasting life. Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 5, Paul writes, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. If we drop over to <clears throat> chapter 2 in verse 6, but one testified in a certain place, actually back in Psalms, What is man? What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care, take care of him? You made him a little while lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the work of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Change resonates with all capital letters through from from Genesis to Revelation change brethren change verse 10 for it is fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Brethren, there's a change that came, and there is a change that is yet to come. There's only one difference. In the one case, it involved ever existence from ever, ever existing. And in the latter case, it involves, if I can say this, forever existing after being born into existence. So remember that there is a change that came, but more importantly for us, a change that is yet to come. There is a difference, no doubt, but the similarities are astounding.